before we get on to the tracks, uh, can we talk about defence? Chris Newton, though, the defence analyst, made a good point, didn't he, about Sakia sort of trying to lay down the, the line to on defence spending to the Prime Minister just a few weeks ago um, when he said, make no mistake, this is a generational multi-decade commitment that the Labour Party would make to defence. Why then, just a couple of weeks later, is Emily Thornbury sort of coming out and saying, no, 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 we can give you absolutely no pledge on increasing the spending to 2.5% when Sir Keir has already said he wants to do it? Well, you're absolutely right that we want to get to 2.5%. Uh, um, what we've said is that in order to set out the pathway of how we get there, uh, we need to be in government because, you know, it's right that the opposition doesn't know all of the details about defence, about all of the, uh, the information of the Ministry of Defence and so on, which is why we've said that if we get in, we would initiate a strategic defence and security review uh, to establish the threats, to work out what we need uh, to invest in to keep the nation safe. And that alongside the spending review, seeing what financial situation, what financial mess, frankly, we would inherit if we did win the next general election, then we can set out our pathway to that 2.5%. So it's a clear commitment uh, to get to that 2.5%, uh, but it's being responsible as well about, from a position of opposition, saying how, what we would need to do to work out the route to get there. Look, it's a perfectly valid point. Everyone acknowledges that you don't have access to the books at the moment, but it's not a clear commitment. Um, when, you know, if anyone's concerned about the defence of this country, when the Tory party say within five years it'll be 2.5% an additional £75 billion, Emily Thornbury saying, um, when circumstances allow, which is so weak it's unbelievable. But look, hang on, the government haven't set out their spending plans up to 2030. So, you know, if the government want to publish their spending plans to 2030 and explain how they're going to get there, then we'll look at them, of course. Uh, and actually, I think that, you know, at the moment, people are, are keen as well to judge the government by their record because they have been in power uh, for 14 years. You know, we know that over £15 billion pounds has been wasted on mismanaged defence procurement uh, since 2010. Uh, we know how much the army uh, has been reduced. You know, people, I think, will look at the government's record over the last 14 years when considering how much they can trust any of the promises they're making now. But you mentioned that review that you would undertake into defence spending if and when you come into power. That's mm. been criticised by Johnny Mercer, the Veterans Minister, uh, saying that the Labour Party wants to spend years holding this review as the world gets more dangerous while refusing to act to keep the British people safe. He says this shows Labour cannot be trusted on defence. What do you say to that? I think that's completely wrong. I think this is about keeping the British people in the UK safe. This is about making sure that we're investing in what we need uh, to keep us safe. And it's about doing it on the basis of evidence when we get into government, because if we get into government, because we can't do it from a position of opposition, because we don't have access to all of the detailed information in the Ministry of Defence and other departments. That's, that's normal for oppositions not to have access to the information. And when it comes to something as important as defence, you know, this is not something you want to make you know, final decisions on from a position of opposition where you don't have access to all that information. So it's the responsible thing to do to keep us safe, to say we would have this security uh, review if we got into government. Government, and on the basis of that, make sure we were spending and investing what is needed to keep us safe. Are you willing, though, to make commitments about the, the rail service in this country? That's right. Well, we're setting out today our detailed plan for reforming the way that the railways would work because I think anyone who travels by rail or tries to travel by rail uh, will know all the problems that we face in terms of cancellations being a record high. You know, the cost of tickets has gone up at twice as fast as wages uh, since 2010. People know that things need to change. And so that's why we set out our plan today, which is about increasing standards for passengers. It's about bringing down costs for taxpayers uh, and it's about supporting economic growth across the country. But all of this takes time, doesn't it? We, you would have to allow for all existing rail contracts to expire in order to, to come under state control. I mean, that's going to take years, isn't it? Some suggestions that could take six years. That means you're going to need a second term to even put this plan into action. Well... You're right to identify the point around waiting for contracts to expire because that's a really important uh, point around it, around the cost, uh, around the fact that there would be no cost to taxpayers of bringing these contracts uh, in-house, of bringing them under the control of Great British Railways because 
you know, if you wait for the contracts to expire and then fold them into Great British Railways, which we would set up, uh, you don't have buyout costs or compensation costs. You know, so that's an important uh, point about how we would implement this. So, yes, it would take time because you have to wait for the contracts to expire, uh, but the contracts should, be, should expire over the course of the next Parliament, which means over the next Parliament we could bring the private train operating companies into Great British Railways alongside folding network rail um, into the new arm's length body and that would mean, then mean that we would have a unified uh, system to run the railways. And, you know, a crucial point around that um, is that, you know, we think there's up to £2.2 billion pounds of waste, uh, which is currently uh, as a result of fragmentation, uh, inefficiencies and so on uh, in the railway network. By unifying that, you could bear down on that cost and save money for taxpayers. Uh, but you would have to spend hundreds of millions of pounds on rolling stock, wouldn't you? That would have to be bought back. And in terms of efficiencies, I mean, that's a big concern. No, sorry, no, sorry, can I just... No, sorry, yeah, can, go I, on. sorry can I just, can I just jump, jump in on that? Because the, the, the rolling stock point, we've been very clear that we would leave the rolling stock arrangements um, as they are, uh, where payments are made for rolling stock leases. And actually, at the moment, the government already pays uh, the rolling stock lease payments. OK. Oh, well, that clears that one up. Jolly good. Um, but in terms of the inefficiencies you mentioned, I mean, what everyone's getting in touch with us this morning and saying, and surely you can understand why, is how do you stop this becoming inefficient if it's a nationalised rail service? Because that's what happened last time. It was inefficient, you know, awful rolling stock, cancellations left, right and centre, flash striking, uh, the unions holding the government to ransom. How would you stop that happening again? Mm, well, you, you, you're right to say this is not about going back. This is about you know, learning the lessons from, from British Rail from the past, but also learning the lessons from privatisation, uh, which has not succeeded in fulfilling its aims in recent years. Because if you look at you know, British Rail in the past, it was you know, arguably much too bureaucratic. Uh, engineers were put first rather than passengers. Uh, and then if you then look at privatisation in recent years, you know, the key aims of privatisation were increasing efficiency, increasing competition, reducing public subsidy. You know, it's failed on, 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 on those counts. You know, so we need to learn the lessons from previous public and private models of delivery and set up our, our new Great British Railways now, which would have all of the, uh, the franchises operated from Great British Rail, uh, so it would be a unified system, uh, but making sure that the private sector would still have a role uh, in terms of open access providers uh, and private uh, freight as well. So it's a pragmatic solution to the fact that the railways right now are broken uh, and passengers deserve better. James Murray, good to see you this morning. Thank you very much indeed.